basking in glorious sunshine today. We set up our tables and chairs in these beautiful gardens, complete with extraordinary topiary. And we're looking forward to digging up some rare gems and hearing some fascinating stories. Coming up... It's just the coolest. He was the coolest, uh, and I think it's just the coolest. You must we wear it. Maybe when, um, on your next outing with your girlfriends, I think. Possibly, yes. We'll go down the pub. <laughs> I genuinely thought you were going to say about £50. No, no. <laughs> really? These, these are really quite historic. This is incredible. It is heaven. And it's... We have a glass of wine for 50 pence. Wow. Oh, but it's not just a menu, it's a menu with a story. Not only is he a gun maker, he also advertised the self adjusting gentleman's truss for the German <laughs> pattern. <laughs> Three really interesting things you've brought us to take a look at today, which are all very similar in type, but what's their story? Well, they were in the family, uh, my husband's family, and we used to have them on display, and, uh, and they gathered a lot of dust. And I was hovering one day, and I broke the beak of one of them. So my husband said, Margaret, I think we'll put these away. So they've been in boxes ever since. And how long ago was that? 20 so, years ago. 20 yes, years. yes. They've survived well, haven't they, they being have, in cardboard boxes yeah. and not around your vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Do you know what they are? Do you know anything about them? Well, my dad used to say that he thought they were like water containers for painters. And I always imagined because of the Japanese prints, people like painting intricate little pictures. So you mentioned Japanese. They are, in fact, Chinese. OK. And you were right, brush pots, but not for necessarily, so they're for holding your brushes. You have something else called a little water pot for okay. putting your water in when you do your calligraphy or your yep. you know, scholarly thing. So mm -hmm. they're scholars' objects. And they're made in bamboo. Yeah. The thing for me, because oh, yeah. it's very fibrous, so to get fine quality carving out of bamboo, yes. you know, sophistication. I mean, they, they, these were sophisticated things, and the carver, you know, was a very, very gifted individual. And the nice thing about these, they've obviously been handled over the years because they just have such wonderful sort of colour and patination and these lovely sort of golden highlights, which, you know, for collectors of this type of thing, wood, bamboo, that's sort of what they want. They want patination. They want things to have been handled, enjoyed and loved. And talking about, you know, the quality of carving, I mean, you just look at the um, you know, this lovely, these sort of pine trees and the way they've managed to sort of incorporate the characteristics of the wood, that lovely kind of, you know, gnarly, knobbly uh, uh, wood there. It's exquisite. Mm -hmm. And similarly, you've got these sort of pine trees and we've got two cranes there. I'm going to guess that that's the one that's the recipient of the vacuum cleaner it incident. Yeah. It can be repaired, but, you know, for me, I don't know. And actually, it's a, bit, it's a nice bit of its history, actually, it for you really, as well. Yeah. Um, so do you like them? Yeah, I love them. I really like them. I think, like I say, it's the detail that I like and they kind of do remind me a bit of a Gustave Klimt painting, some of the shapes and that kind of abstraction. So, yeah, they're beautiful. Yeah. And then we really haven't talked about this lovely, what this is called a, a sort of a mountain, and you have these lovely sort of pagoda here with these immortals, you know, lots going on, these sort of grotto scenes. And again, just this may be where the argument starts with you. I think those two are a little bit, in terms of quality of carving, I think those are a little bit better. Yeah. But. I think that's more involved, there's a lot more going on. Mm -hmm. So, age. I think they're all later Qing, so all kind of 19th century, and they would be desirable. Chinese are buying these back. If they came up for auction, this one in the front, I think, is probably would carry a pre-sale estimate of between 1,500 to 2,500. Wow. Lovely. Similarly, I think this one also would be about 1,500 to 2,500. And this one, although bigger, maybe just a pinch less, 1,000 to 1,500, wow. something like that. Yeah. So collectively, what's that? It's about four or 5,000, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Amazing. Oh. Yeah, they're beautiful. Holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Pick your best now. You're better. <laughs> lovely things. I mean, lovely, lovely things. Oh. Thanks so much for bringing them in. Thank it's you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Oh, it's fabulous. So if you think of Scotland, you think of rugby, you think of football, Golf, the home of golf. You don't think of baseball. What's going on? In 1952, when my dad was 23, he used to listen to the World Services radio and listen to the baseball matches. Um, and he wrote to the Brooklyn Dodgers, as they were at the time, to ask them for a, a run behold. They wrote back to him and said, we'll, we'll do one better than that. We'll, we'll take you across to New York and come, and come and see the team and come and watch the games. So he boarded a flight from Presswick. Uh, took about, I don't know, 16 hours to get to Isle Wild in, in New York and uh, spent about uh, seven, eight days with the Brooklyn Dodgers at the time. 
he got to throw one of the first balls of the season. So it's a, a, a publicity visitor. stunt on their part as well then to have a Scott because you can see here they made the most of it. Yeah. And it is uh, a staggering story. I think when he arrived uh, on the plane and they had a brass band and really? the whole TV uh, thing. And so you've got the Dodgers hat, you've got various photographs and the signed ball. And this ball signed presumably in 1952, you've got all of the signatures of the players and what looks like some of the owners, mm. but this ball is elevated because of one signature. That name there, Jackie Robinson. You ever heard of him? Oh, we have heard of him, yes. Not only was he the first black player, he's a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just everything couldn't get better. You could argue the same as Jesse Owens really sort of made it acceptable and ended segregation in sport. He was signed in the late 40s uh, at playing in a white team. So value. The market is going to be in America. It's a very specialist market, but I think easily four to six thousand pounds. Wow. Okay. There you go, Mum. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the coolest. He was the coolest, uh, and I think it's just the coolest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Such a beautiful sunny day like today Indeed, has put yes. a huge smile on my face anyway. But when I saw this, it lit me up even more. It is a stunning brooch, but I want to pick it up and show you that it'll make you smile. I'm smiling already. You're smiling already. <laughs> because look at the way it moves. Yes. When it moves, it comes alive. Yeah. And the person that wears it yes. comes alive too. So who has been wearing it? Well, it was handed down to me through the family. I inherited it from my mother. It came from her mother. Uh, apparently, I believe, from great-grandmother. And whether it came as a gift or whether it was a family piece further on than that, I don't know. But there was a, a few nice selected pieces of jewelry within the family. And this is one that I very fortunately ended up with. This is about 19, quintessentially sort of, of the Edwardian period. Right, yeah. I mean, mm. 1900 was a very elegant mm. era, you know. Yes. All the heavy, yes. the heavy clothes of the Victorian period and Queen mm -hmm. Victoria in mourning. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly, there was yes. gaiety and life, and that's what this jewel yes. reflects, gaiety and life. Something right. like this would just catch the eye. It certainly would, yes. And it's English, it's made in platinum. It, you've got these circular mixed cut blue sapphires that are from Sri Lanka or Ceylon then. And it is set with rose-cut diamonds with a few cushion-shaped diamonds. And these tassel drops here with pear-shaped sapphires, they have it's what's called knife wire edges. Mm -hmm. And this is when platinum came into really being worked in the 1900. Okay. And you, because of it's, it's a strong metal, you really were able to get really fine detail with mm -hmm. the platinum, which before it was silver and you couldn't, it was too soft silver and it would tarnish. Yeah. So it makes these stones look like they're just floating, mm -hmm. which is making it so special. Would I spoil the value of it or the whole piece if I took off tassels and had them made into earrings, which might be more appropriate to wear in this day and age at some stage? I'm glad you've asked me before mm -hmm. you've done that yeah. or even <laughs> thought, thought about yeah. taking it to a jewel. No. Fair comment. Because can you see how it is with those drops? Oh, can yes. you imagine without that? It would be a bar, wouldn't it? Or it would block. be, and it would never look complete. No. I mean, it's a design I've not seen before. Mm -hmm. It's beautifully crafted, hasn't been tampered with. So at auction, I would say this would be in the region of four to six thousand pounds. Mm. Mm. Thank you. You must wear it. Maybe when um, on your next outing with your girlfriends, I Possibly, think. Possibly, yes. We'll go down the pub. Go down Bring the out pub. your sparklies, girls. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think so. I'm sure you've been admiring the gardens at the back of some of our shots here at Crathers because they are gorgeous. And let me tell you, the air is heavy with the scent of blooms. James, you're the head gardener here. Lucky man, what a great job. Hi, Do you, you want to show me around a little bit? Tell Absolutely. me a bit about them. Sure. The wall garden here at Crathers, it's just on a shade under four acres. There's eight separate themed gardens um, over three terraces. 
And this dates from about the 1920s? Yeah, the lower garden here dates from the 1920s, but actually the history from the 1640s with Sir Thomas Burnett, and that's when the foundation of the garden really starts. There are eight distinct gardens here now, but what would it have looked like back then? Oh, a very different Fiona. The lower garden here would have been solely fruit and vegetables to supply the castle itself. And normally in a castle like this, you'd expect the wall guard to be far away because the, yes. uh, the laird wouldn't want to see the staff, as it were, uh -huh. <laughs> toiling away. But this is close. Yeah, this is close. This is one of the few survivals, uh, certainly in the area here and probably much wider, where the grounds stayed close to the castle rather than being removed to remove the staff from the view. God forbid they should see people actually working on the garden. And then the yew hedges and then the topi, I've been really struck by that. Yeah, that's the real core still of the historic side of the garden. The oldest egg and egg cups date from 1702, and then the rest of the old formal layout and the parterre up there date through to about 1765. So you've got a slice of 400 years of history across the garden still today. Well, you're doing a fabulous job here. That's great, thanks you. Thank you. You brought me two Harry Potters. One is a Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, and the other. Now, what's exciting to me is that this one has an inscription in it. It says, I think, to the Pope family, with many thanks for introducing Harry to so many people, J.K. Rowling. Okay, it's a good start. <laughs> now, this one isn't a first edition. It's dated 1997. It's a paperback, but it's not one of the incredibly rare first editions. It's also quite a well read copy, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> So now this is a first edition. This is the. Chamber of Secrets, and again, here we go, another inscription. To the Pope family, again, hoping you like this one as much, J.K. Rowling. Tell me about the Pope family potters. <laughs> OK, I, I was a primary teacher at a local primary school, and um, about 20 years ago, I read this book to the class. Anyway, the kids loved it, uh, became very excited about it, became very excited about the characters. And then we heard that J.K. Rowling was coming to a bookstore in Aberdeen. So um, I got a bus and took 30 of them in to meet her. Right. And the children were so excited about it. They wanted to know what was going to happen to the characters next. And they came in with money to buy the new book. And and um, J.K. Rowling took an hour with us. She inscribed um, the children's books that they bought. And um, yeah, she, she read the first chapter of Chamber of Secrets to the children and she introduced the character, the right. Dobby. And the magic, obviously, was that the fun yeah. shone through. That's what she right. you know, really got the, the children hooked on the book. J.K. Rowling didn't sign very much after the first two books because she was just so famous. Mm -hmm. But this is something completely different. This is right almost back at the beginning where she's signing very generously, quite fully. You've got four lines there. That's very nice. Now, the true first edition of The Philosopher's Stone is one of those celebrated books that makes tens of thousands of pounds. It's not one of those, but it's inscribed. The Chamber of Secrets, that is a first edition, dated 1998, and you've also got a nice long inscription too. And so I think together, and I'd like to value them together, um, I think I'd be very happy to put an estimate of two to three thousand pounds on them. Wow. Boy, that's, that's quite, quite amazing. <laughs> so I think they will be going in Gringotts vault tonight, I think. <laughs> Certainly worth looking after. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Well, I'll tell you something. This could do with a fair amount of restoration. Yes. Has it been in the family for many, many years or not? Many, many, many years, yes. It was my dad's granddad's, and his granddad was born in 1850. So when he got it, we don't know, but my dad can remember it from when you were 10, from when he was 10. Be honest with me, when did you last have it running? About, I can remember because I used to wind it. Yeah. And I remember hearing it chiming, and I lived at home at the time. OK, let's have a look. The arch is signed with a silvered boss, J. Graham of Edinburgh. But let's have a proper look at the movement. In line with all these sort of clocks, you've got subsidiary second dial and large spandrels and dolphin frets up here in the arch. Let us take it off here and you can see immediately that it's had a bit of a ding there. It's yes. fallen out of the case, hasn't it? Which yes. is a bit of a shame. And that's not been cleaned for a very, very long time. Now, it's never been cleaned as far as, as, far as you remember. Well, obviously, when it had its fall, 
down there, it's got its broken dial foot, so it's torn away from the movement itself, and that has resulted in the winding squares not tying up. Do you see yes. that this dial should be up quite a bit? The clock dates from the early part of the 19th century, sort of 1820s. Typical Scottish long case in, in an oak case. And I want you just to look down there at that pendulum. It's beautifully painted with flowers. Typically Scottish, yeah, absolutely okay. typical. You don't see that sort of thing south of the border. Don't value. Not necessarily, yeah. because my dad's was best man at my son's wedding, yeah, and yeah. he's giving it to his grandson Lovely. for a wedding present. Lovely. I just want to know if it's worth restoring. In this instance, it's clearly worth restoring. So I'm going to say to you, in this shocking state, and it is shocking, yes. no, yes. if you got more than about 100 to 150 at auction, you'd be doing terribly well. Yeah. Because it's so rough. Yes, yes, we're aware how rough it is. When it's up and running and polished and looking gorgeous, uh, you'd probably have to pay towards £3,000 uh, in the okay. trade for it, from, or from a dealer. So. This wreck will one day be rather nice. <laughs>
acquired it recently. I got it as a present from my parents for my 40th birthday and my mum had it um, and she used to wear it. I wore it last weekend, actually. I think um, it drew some admiring glances, yeah, didn't yeah, it? lots yes. of my friends liked it. All right, well, let's give you a description of it. Now, have you noticed that the little flower heads are a different colour to the plaques? Can you see that they are slightly greenish actually, yes. in colour? This is a technique known as two-colour gold, de couleur mm. in French. Mm -hmm. The stones, the dark green ones are called bloodstones because the little flecks of red in the bloodstone mm. were supposed to be representative of Christ's blood. Wow. The brown stones are called cornelian. Now, these are natural hard stones that were used all the time mm -hmm for jewellery mm. in this era of around about George III. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, all of the individual little stones are engraved mm -hmm. with heads. You've mm -hmm. spotted that, have These heads that they depict things like Greek philosophers, mm -hmm. you know, like Plato and people mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. The thing about this piece that is absolutely super mm -hmm. is its condition. Mm. Anything else you want to know? Um, how was it made? How was it made? Handmade, I can tell you that. The craftsmanship wow. that went into this would have been absolutely amazing mm -hmm. because in those days it would have taken months for someone mm -hmm. to create something like this. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you want to know what it's worth? Yes. Yes. Four to five thousand pounds. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have thought that. And I wore it last weekend. <laughs> Luckily mm. it didn't fall off. I mm. love oh, no. this kind of jewellery yeah. and I'm very, very, you know, mm. I'm very pleased that you brought this in because oh. this is really smashing. Well, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very thank much. You. This is the most beautifully elegant Art Deco figure. Where did it come from? It actually came from my mother-in-law's cousin and it used to sit on top of a bureau in her house and when she died my mother-in-law inherited the house and the contents though so she said to her sons um, you take what you would like from the house before it gets cleared so i decided that i would just take would have chosen yeah. this is austrian art deco yeah. it comes from the firm of hagenau a workshop based in vienna and a lot of their designs were based on mm -hmm. african sculpture tribal mm -hmm. sculpture yeah. you can sort of see it in this this one's not so obvious no but I've had a similar one, and it was an African woman dancing oh, with wonderful. a wooden skirt. Yeah, she's just so beautifully yeah. made. The craftsmanship, know. you know, is fantastic. They really lovely. got it yeah. right. right. Mm -hmm. Often their things were all wood or all bronze. I loved the mixed materials. This mm -hmm. one is bronze and wood, and look how elegantly. Oh, she's beautiful. This Absolutely skirt beautiful. is carved. The pleats, the flow is magnificent. This is probably from about 1929 to 1932. Perfect. It's a good size and it just makes that impact, doesn't it? It does. She's absolutely beautiful. And they have always held their price. Oh. And one today like this now in a smart gallery, and these do sell in smart galleries because, like you said, they look great on smart bits of furniture, cabinets yeah. and tables and yeah. things. The smart gallery would ask 1500 to £1,700 pounds for this. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's good. That's good to know. Not that I would ever sell her. <laughs> Nor would I if I owned her. <laughs> I'm looking at this delightful portrait of this little girl and I'm looking at your face and there's definitely an uncanny resemblance, almost a magnetism between you and this portrait. So it's got to be a family member. It's my mother, yeah, when she was five, five, five years, years old age. and it was 1930. So she went to a fancy dress party um, at the Mansion House in London in the aid of Save the Children Fund and she was dressed as a snowball um, and she won first prize and first prize was to have her portrait painted by Simon Elwes but she was very disappointed because she spied a doll's pram which was one of the other prizes and that's what she really wanted. What a delightful story. Yeah. Quite grandeur in a way to have your portrait painted. I know, it must have been a very um, upmarket party I think. So this is her here in her snowball costume, not looking terribly happy and it's quite fun, all the other little children all dressed up. And I've got another photograph of her with the artist. Isn't picture. it adorable, though? Yeah, she doesn't look all that happy there, actually. And she looks a bit grumpy. <laughs> yeah, she does. And uh, he's actually made her there. smile, which yes, is rather yes, sweet. Yes, exactly. Now, let's come to the artist. Do you know much about Simon Elwes? No, I just know that he was a society painter of the time. OK. Clearly signed Simon Elwes and dated 1930. 
So he was born in um, 1902 and he was one of eight children. Um, he trained at the Slade School and this portrait is very Slade School in all its tendencies and the way it's painted. Right. Um, and he's an mm. artist you don't really see many pictures coming up at auction now. No. And that's really because most of them are tucked away in rather wonderful houses and treasured. Yeah. And he was a great favourite for the royal family too. But a really interesting artist and, you know, a great portrayal of a young girl, uh, your mother, at the age of five, getting all that personality out, particularly looking at that photograph and looking at her a little bit grumpy. Yes. <laughs> now, it's a family portrait. It's obviously very, very dear to you. It's painted at the height of his powers, uh, still very commercial and worth at least two to three thousand pounds. Is it? Right. Interesting. I'm not going to be selling it, though. <laughs> Gorgeous story. Thank yeah. you so much. No, not at all. This week we're playing our old favourite, Basic, Better, Best. Gordon Foster, you brought along three items of Scottish silver. Mm -hmm. And the aim of the game is to put them in order of value, from basic to better to best. Now, this is your special area, of course, Scottish silver, and very appropriate here at Crathers. It is indeed, and what I thought I'd do is try and really test you. OK. <laughs> and all of you as well. That is the best way to start, and that's just in the middle here. So that is a whisky cup, but it's a thistle-shaped whisky cup. So quite specific to Scotland. And you do find this with Scottish silver shapes that are just specifically made in Scotland. So this is quite a small measure, so called a tot cup. And they do come, you'll be relieved to know, in larger sizes, right up to a sort of mug size. OK. But that's our earliest chap from about 1700, 1710. And then in order of date, then, this is obviously the next piece. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> this is quite unusual. This is about 1890, 1900. Arts and crafts in style. This is made on the tiny island of Iona. Oh, I love Iona. It's beautiful, yeah. isn't it? So this was a silversmith working around about 1900, Alexander Ritchie. He primarily made small souvenir pieces for holiday makers, so he didn't make larger pieces very often. So this, you've probably guessed, is the most recent. Of course. This is 1947. So it's post-war, moving into modernist style, and completely pared-down design by a designer called Leslie Auld, who taught at the Glasgow School of Art and set up a really world-renowned silversmithing course. And in terms of what might affect our choice, are we looking at rarity? Are we looking at quantity of silver? Doesn't always mean something. Size doesn't always mean something. It's more collectability, I would say, I would point you towards, if anything. What do we, has anyone got any ideas here? I think he's sneaky, he's, the smallest one's the most valuable. Oh, he's definitely oh. sneaky. <laughs> yeah. There was someone back here, so you thought? Yes, the, the, the one from the island, I reckon, that's the oldest. I own it. You think that's the, the most valuable? The most valuable one. I wondered about that, actually. You had a thought. The same with the, the jug, because it's so ornate, and it's, mm. you said it's quite unusual, because it wasn't the sort of pieces they did. They did the souvenirs. <coughs> You sound like you know a lot about Scottish silver with your <laughs> accent. Ancestors from Aberdeen, family from Aberdeen. Right, all the way up to Australia. OK. New Zealand. New Zealand. <laughs> Classic error. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> That's me finished. Anyone else? Anyone over here? Yes. I think the tree, probably, because he mentioned Auld and the Glasgow School of Art. It's probably quite rare, I would think. Of course, renowned for Rennie McIntosh. Oh, so we've got, got variety. three different things here. Well, I don't know how helpful that is, really. Well, in terms of collectability, you see, I think collectability this, rarity that. But I am going to say, even though this... I'm going to say basic, better... Who went for this one? Yes. Best. <laughs> Nearly. <laughs> <laughs> but not quite. <laughs> oh, no. Well, it's either right or it's not right. No. Go on, tell well, us. Well, this is the basic. OK, well, that was good. Yeah, you've got that, £2,000. The better and best are flipped. Right. This is the better, 3000 and this is the best, 5000 And why is that the best, and is it rarity? It's the rarity and collectability. It's Alexander Ritchie of Iona, so it's a desirable piece, it's a rare piece. It's probably the only one. So at the moment, the market would dictate for that, and that is the best. 
I should have listened to the lady from New Zealand. <laughs> you with your Scottish forebears, and I'd have got that right. Yeah. Oh, well, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. Well, when I saw him earlier, I asked how he was, and he said he's feeling a little rough. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> what is he, a St Bernard? I presume he's a St Bernard. And he's close to it. A family St Bernard or a no, purchase I'm St, St Bernard? Acquired 20 years ago. In a... See, it would take an eccentric moment to, to come home with that. So tell me what you thought you were buying. I went to Olympia Antique Fair and I just came across this. I knew Stife were uh, important and I just found it divine and I'm afraid I felt I had to have it. He was one of the largest um, stuffed animals that they produced. They also did a, a bear roughly this size. Yeah. He has a voice which <laughs> doesn't quite do justice <laughs> to, to the level of, of, of canine magnificence that we have there. Was he in this condition when you, when you bought him? Uh, pretty much so. The date that it was given to me was 1891, and he's done a lot of living in over 100 years. But he had a bit of action since he arrived uh, home in Scotland. Uh, the first challenge, um, now married with a young puppy, uh, the young puppy somehow accesses the room where he is, which is why the front paws are missing. Oh. Oh, no! It was a dog attack. It was, that was dog attack, and then a second dog attack when very, very nice friends were staying with a Staffordshire Bull Terrier, and that's how he lost peace out of his chest. So the Staffy tried to get to his heart? He, he did. <laughs> and he petrifies the dogs. I mean, one of our Labradors just panics when he meets this one, particularly when this one barks at him. The sort of thing that any well-brought-up dog would expect to meet no. is, is a stuffed dog on wheels. No. The date you said that you were given when you purchased it was 1891. Yes. I am going to differ with that date. Right. The eyes are back painted glass and they tended to come into fashion uh, just before the First World War. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want to put him at a date before 1910. Right. Have you thought about getting it restored? Yes, I'd had some minor restoration done when I originally got it, but really it's the wear and tear of, of life since. I'm going to ask what you paid for it at Olympia, that grand emporium of antiques. In my dotty moment, I paid £1,000. All right. It was a slightly dotty moment. Now I think you would struggle to get £1,000 for it. I think you really would struggle. So I would have said between perhaps five and £800 in this right. condition. I'm not at all surprised. And frankly, he's had a very good life over the last 20 years. So <laughs> he was not bought to make money. He was, he was bought to have fun. Well, during the programme and over the years, Fiona and I have had a few times where we've had competitions and I've tested her knowledge to see quite how much she's learned. I sense your knowledge is going to be a little bit strong. Tell me about them. What do you know? I know this is Moser. I know this is Oropus. This one, I hope, is Royal Pale, but I'm not sure. So where have you been buying these? Is, are you an avid collector? Yes, I, I buy them at auctions. And was it just looking for things you like, just trying to find that quirk or that object that somebody else has missed? I was looking for a bargain. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you been doing this now? I would say about 20 years. Wow. Well, let's see what we're dealing with. So the one at the front here, this is a fish growl. Yes. Designed by Edward Howald for Orophores and will date from around the late 1940s, there or thereabouts. The one here, Rudolf Welz for Moser, yes. date about 1925, 1926. This one you're unsure of, what did yes. you buy it as? I bought it hoping it was at Royal Braille, but it was in the catalogue as premium. Okay. But I'd seen the colours and the, the cut in a picture in a, on a badge. Okay, so catalogued as Bohemian, hoping it's Royal Briley. Mm hmm Yes. It's Stevens and Williams Royal Briley. Good. Well Good. done. Good spot. So I'm guessing then there's a bit more to this. If you've been doing this 20 odd years, so 150 pieces. Yes, but all sorts. Well, if this is a sample, I'd really like to see the other 250 at home. Let's see how well you've done. Let's let's run through some prices for you, okay? Okay. What did you pay for the Graal? 250. It's worth 400. Good. What 360, did... I paid for that one. 360. Mm -hmm. It's worth 600. Very nice. 
What did you pay for the decanter? 75. 75? Yes. It's worth a thousand. <laughs> The reason it's worth a thousand pounds and it's the star out of these three objects, it's a double colour casement. Uh -huh. If you just take up the stopper here, you've got green, you've got citron on the inside and clear crystal. It's a Thank double colour, Stevens and Williams, 1920s, thousand pounds. Well done, Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a menu. Should we take a look inside? Okay. We've got uh, a T-bone special for £4.25. Moving along, we can have a well, banana split for 95 pence. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we're feeling thirsty, we can have a glass of wine for 50 pence or the <laughs> bottle for £2.25. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just a menu. It's a menu with a story and with some signatures on the front. My sister to the Hard Rock Cafe in London, which was the place to go. And um, we had to queue for a very, very long time outside it. And just as we neared the end of the queue, ready to go in, people just walked straight past us into the cafe. And as, a, as an eight-year-old and a six-year-old who'd been there a long time, we weren't that impressed that someone had just queue jumped, jumped basically. <laughs> And then uh, the rumour came around that that was Abba who just walked in. And then when we got into the cafe, we were sat a couple of tables away from them, um, went over to them and they were so lovely. They asked a waiter to bring a menu over to sign. Um, they took their time. They didn't just sign it. They wrote it. They drew a little picture. I mean, 1978, Abba rule the world. They've just had three consecutive number ones in this country. And we've got Benny here and he's drawn you, drawn you a picture. What's going on there? I think that's a little smiley man with a hat and a balloon. And, and then we've got Bjorn here. Uh-huh. And is that, who's that? Is that? I Anna, think Anna Frieda, Anna, Anna, I think. Yeah. Anna Frieda there. But no Agneta. No, and we were quite disappointed not to see her as well. Um, but I think a few months later, she announced her divorce. So we kind of speculated ah, to her she, she wasn't, wasn't there. there at the time. Right. I have to say that had we had all four signatures here, it would be a different story. We'd be looking at quite a bit of money, perhaps okay. £500 maybe, right. for okay. a signed menu with that great uh -huh. story. But I think we need to be more realistic with mm -hmm. the, the collector's market for that. And I think for three signatures in the circumstances, I think you're looking at perhaps £100. That's lovely. I'm but very happy with that. I'm sure. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you for the music. <laughs> if you tilt this glass to the light, you'll find that it's really flat and quite even. So what was the glass like that was being made in the 14th century? Well, I'll tell you, it was rubbish. And so that means it's Victorian or 20th century glass. There was a huge vogue for antique stuff that was called historismus around 1880 to about 1930. I hope you didn't pay more than a tenner. No. I reckon it's got to be worth at least 9.99. <laughs> When you opened the box to show me this, yeah. and I saw it, I couldn't believe Check, triple check, with my glass to make sure it was what I think it is. Right. What do you think it is? I don't know, that's why I'm, that's why I'm here. This is a 17th century Dutch marriage casket, and it's beautiful, oh silver gilt, and it's 350 years old or thereabouts. I mean, and it looks like new. That's why I had to look at it again and again to be sure. The gilding is perfect, but it is covered in love symbols. All these plaques illustrate love. You press the clasp at the front to yeah. release the lid, yes. and it's a cherub with his bow and arrow, Cupid. Oh. And on this lovely domed lid here, we have a beautiful panel where their clasped hands reached across a landscape are clutching a smouldering heart. On this side panel here, you have a group of people dancing, celebrate the love of the couple. On the back panel, you have the marriage at Canaan, celebrating marriage, the marriage that Jesus attended in the New Testament, where he turned the water to wine. On this panel, you've got 
Cupid, fire. I mean, this is incredible. It's all singing and dancing. It is heaven. They're in heaven, I'm in heaven, oh, looking good. at it. <laughs> and it's got a heavenly value. Oh, A thing like well. this. Yeah. It's about three to five thousand pounds. Goodness me. Wow. Didn't expect that. It's a stunning yeah. thing. It is beautiful, isn't it? It really yeah. is beautiful. Wow. Thank you. I'm rather hoping that the contents of this box will live up to the quality of this box. Let's have a look. Ooh, yes, they do. That is lovely. It is a glorious example of a percussion shotgun. How did you acquire it? Well, my late husband bought it at an auction about 38 years ago. Yeah. In uh, Battlesbridge in Essex. and. It's been sitting in the bottom of a wardrobe ever since. It's in absolutely fabulous condition. It's percussion muzzle loading. The locks are colour case hardened. It must have spent a lot of time in its box because air oxidises and it will take those colours off. Barrels, this superb pattern. This is Damascus twist. This is bands of iron and steel wrapped and then etch to bring up this pattern, which is why it's so spectacular. I'm going to put it together. <gasps> Never seen it together. Well, here you go. Here's a first. So... <laughs> and now we have it... Wow. ..together. It was made by a Joseph Skeet, who was foreman to Joseph Egg, who was a very well-known gun maker. Now, Egg was on one Piccadilly, so that gives us a good date. He was on Piccadilly in the 1840s. Um, interesting thing about Egg, not only was he a gun maker, he also advertised during that period the self-adjusting gentleman's truss for the German <laughs> pattern. So, gun maker and truss maker to the, 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 wow. <laughs> the quality. I don't suppose you know what your husband for it? I think between 550 to 600. Okay. If you had to buy this again at auction, mm -hmm. 1500 to 2000. Oh, very nice. And I've just spotted this. It's for putting percussion caps on the nipple, and you can pop another 400 pounds on that one. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so all I can say is he had a very, very good eye because this is real quality. Before we hear from our next visitor, I want to let you know about a special programme we're planning. On the 3rd of September 1939, Britain declared war on Germany. To mark the 80th anniversary of the outbreak of the Second World War, we're making a programme that traces the first year of the conflict. From the home front and the evacuation to the countryside, to the Battle of the Atlantic and Dunkirk will explore the lasting impact of the war through a selection of cherished possessions. If you have a story, please contact us at antiques.roadshow at bbc.co.uk. So it's been a gloriously sunny day here at Crathers Castle, and uh, this is a gloriously sunny painting. What can you tell me about why you bought the painting? I had been down in Edinburgh in 1983, and I'd seen this painting which I liked. My mother was alive at that particular point, but she subsequently died. And so I said to my wife, uh, I'd like to buy that in memory of my mother. There are elements that really appeal to people when they collect Scottish paintings. I mean, this is a beautiful turn of the century sort of era picture. He's an artist I'd describe as being a Scottish Impressionist. Yeah. So it's all this, you know, they've moved away from this interior scene, very dark Victorian yes, genre yes. scene pictures, being influenced by the French Impressionists, by the Hague School in, in Holland. All this sort of airiness and light was being brought back into to Scottish art and, and colour was beginning to sort of become the main focus. Yes. So what do you particularly like about this painting? I like the sky. I like yeah. the whole painting. I like the colours, the He was good colors, at skies, but I, yeah. I do like the sky. I know, it's this beautiful sweep, you know, you've got the sense of a kind of sea breeze coming in here. There's this amazing blue that you do get on the west coast yes, of Scotland, yeah. this very yes. sort of clear, bright blue. Yeah. I love these little crofters' cottages, the detail yes. here. Yes. And then you can see um, 
the influence of people like William McTaggart and these beautiful little children playing on the sand. It's got every element you could look for in a landscape. This is actually Macrahanish Beach, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. And a lot of people have a connection to that sort of part of the West Coast in Scotland. So in terms of subject matter, this is actually a, a sort of positive point in its favour. And I think, of course, it's the fact that it is a gloriously sunny day. It's a cheerful picture to have on the wall. I'm sure it just brightens any room that you have it hanging in. I'm glad you like it. Can I ask how much you paid originally back in the 80s? You can. She was asking 1400 I think you sort of got her down to a good bargain I think, there. I think I did, yes. Yes, yes. I mean, the, the market for traditional Scottish paintings this period, it has gone down a little bit. However, I think it's been a good purchase, and I think on a good day at auction, uh, with a good following wind, you'd be looking at two to three thousand pounds. Well, that's all right. Yeah. Can't complain about that. No. Well, thank you very much for bringing this in. It's lovely thank to you. see such a fine Scottish painting in this beautiful Scottish setting. Perfect. Thank you very much. My husband's great uncle used to work in this bookshop in Edinburgh okay. and he collected autographs. You only have to go in a few pages and here we've got Arthur Conan Doyle. Over the page, here we go, Walter Scott. <laughs> you know this one here? I don't know who that is. It's Big Squiggle, one of the most characteristic signatures in English literature. No. Charles Dickens. Oh, wow. Just from the ones I've seen and going on average, You've got to be looking at seven or eight hundred pounds here. Wow. That's great. <laughs> Just for bits of paper that someone's cut out of books and letters. <laughs> well. That's one way of putting it. Yeah. This is a very simple looking silver bowl, isn't it? And I, I, I really probably late 17th century. But first off, tell me how you have it. Well, it was given to me by my godmother. Yes. Um, for my confirmation, actually, I would have been about 11, and she died very soon after, so I don't know very much about her at all. Right. But she came from a very wealthy family, and she looked after my father's family, who were not at all wealthy. My grandfather had died um, as a missionary. Right, OK. And so she sort of took care of his family. Right, OK. But I don't know much about it at all. Well, let's tell you something about it, because what is absolutely apparent to me straight away is that it has an English hallmark, and we can see that there. And In fact, that Birmingham hallmark is for 1913. But why does it look like a 17th century piece of silver? Well, of course, people historically bought, borrowed designs from different epochs, different countries, and this is very much in the French style. The sort of punch work, uh, and that's particularly, we can see on the bottom there, and repoussé work, which is raised work, okay. and, you know, kind of formed from the, from the back. And I love the simplicity of it. It's very sort of arts and crafts in yes. a way. Um, but if we turn it around and have a look at another part of it, we can see that there are some initials. I presume those are family initials. Diana. Perhaps. Her name is Diana. Right, OK. But we can also see that there's another mark, and it's a crown, and underneath it says DSCG. Do you know what DSCG stands for? No. It stands for the... Now, it's quite difficult, I think, in this day and age, for us to kind of express something like that. Yeah. But, in fact, the Duchess of Sutherland set up a charitable guild uh, to train ill children or children from poor backgrounds, basically, to have a trade so that they could make headway in okay. life. Essentially, youngsters were taught all sorts of crafts from uh, textiles to printing to silversmithing. Oh. So the idea that this could have been made by a teenager is quite incredible, isn't it? It is. But it that is, is exactly lovely. what happened. Yeah. How does that make you feel about the object? I really, that makes me like it more, actually. I mean, I'd always liked it, but I love that story. So what's it worth? Monetarily, probably two or three hundred pounds. It's not a huge, mm -hmm. huge amount of money, but I think there's a lot more value yeah. locked up yeah, in the charitable good. tale yeah. that led to this being yeah. made. That's lovely. Thank, thank you, you very for bringing much. it along. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. I think anybody who grew up in the 60s or 70s will remember brown, slightly heavy earthenware like this. But looking at the, the, the mark on the bottom, please return to modelling department. Yes. Um, there's a story here, isn't there? Yes. This is my grandfather, Eric Owen. It's a self-bust. And this is where that Wedgwood ever did. Between the wars, Wedgwood was at a very interesting point. They'd kind of gone from their old original factory at Etruria to the the new factory at Barlaston, and they were really kind of changing things. Eric owns a, a, a name perhaps not everybody no. knows, and I often think it's people like your grandfather, who are in many ways the unnamed heroes, who made these things, which we've all have at home and use, 
but never think as we're pouring our gravy that somebody actually took the time to design this. Here he is, the man himself, a self-portrait, and then these two really amazing pieces by him, which kind of show the skill he had. These are always fascinating and privileged things to see, really, because they've come from your private yeah. collection, passed down through the family, and here we are seeing them maybe for the first time in public. Yes. Um, and they're quite hard to value. I mean, something like that, you know, frankly, that would be in a charity shop, it would be £5. Yes. Pounds. yes. That yes. makes it a bit more expensive. But these pieces are difficult to value because they're one of a kind. I don't think they're worth thousands. I've never thought they were worth thousands, but they are special to us. So this late 30s, early 40s period is a critical time in Wedgwood's design history. Mm -hmm. and, and these are kind of very iconic of that time. So we'll want to own them if these ever came to market. So a bust of Eric Owen by himself is 1,500, 2,000 pounds. Really? And these, both of which in their own way are, are iconic of the style, of the period, they're going to be 1,000 to 1,500 each. Wow, thank you very much. And honestly, I never thought he'd be worth that much. Well, it's just great grandfather. Yes, he used to hang on the outside of the kitchen wall. Oh. Exactly, so thank you for bringing them okay. in. And maybe you should return this to the modelling department. Maybe I should, <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Well, I see you've got a lovely Rolex Submariner here. Yes. Obviously, you're a professional diver. Yes, was, finished now. Tell me about your life underwater. Were you in the services to start with? Or I not? started off in the service at 15. I joined the Navy. I spent just over 13, nearly 14 years in the Navy. Came out uh, and then went diving in Europe. The actual offshore opened yeah. up with the drilling and all that. Yeah. So I was went it in, into in that. In the 70s, was this? In the 70s, yeah. yeah early yeah. 70s. Went into that for a short while and then joined up with Comix, uh, the French diving company. But it was cutting edge stuff, wasn't it? It was, you know, you know doing repairs on pipelines and, and things like that. Fantastic. The joy of this Submariner is that it has no date. Mm -hmm. And, oh wow, look, it's even got Comex on the back, Rolex Comex. So that's a lovely, lovely feature. Can I peek in here? By all means, yes. And that's wonderful. Again, another Submariner with the full Comex logo there. Is this Comex on the back of this one too? Uh, more than probably, yes. So the watches are merely stainless steel. They're yes. not precious metal. No. Nope. They're designed to be utilitarian, mm -hmm. as you well know. And you've got all the guarantee cards, all the paperwork is as required, and that is fantastic. So when did you retire? How long ago? 20 years ago. And now, prices, from the collector's point of view, Comex is just that magic word because it means it's been used in the environment that these yeah. things were meant to be used. Yeah. Collectors love them, absolutely love them. Have you got all your diving logbooks? Somewhere, yeah. Well, let's start with this one, which is a Comex watch, yeah. as we saw from the back. If it was just a plain Submariner, we'd be looking at sort of six to eight thousand pounds with a Comex, realistically, probably up towards twenty thousand. Yeah. I am, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> processing it. <laughs> <laughs> and this one, with all the full kit and the Comex and your name on the back and with your diving logbooks. Yeah. It's going up, is it? It's going up significantly. Oh, good. I think we could probably think in terms of 40 to 50,000 pounds. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That oh, magic oh, oh. word Comex. What you have to remember is that these Rolex sport watches are going through the roof. Yeah. Happy? That'd be a good meal, that. Huh? <laughs> you can take me out as well. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just before we go, I want to show you this item which rather tickled me. It's less circa 1920s lacrostic, more weapon of war. Because the girl who owned it. Jean Adamson has written